Sí, sí. So good morning. We were in the Marcos working group focused on biology, uh, systems biology and bioinformatics. Uh, basically, we learned how the complexity of biological systems can be explained through um, nonlinear differential equations. And an example of a process uh, described by this file is uh, the regulation of gene expression and circadian circles. Also, uh, uh, the homeostasis processes in various biological systems can be explained by these files. Uh, the power of systems biology allow us to predict so many stuff that can be naturally occurring. So, focusing in a gene expression, for instance, we can see that many things are necessary to describe our models, and just to mention some of them, we can have some concepts like cooperativity, cooperativity and allosterity, and also feedback loops and different kinds of oscillations. So now I will let you with Yolanda. A uh, feedback loop is formed by elements connected in a closed chain. Uh, feedback loops can be positive or negative. It depends on the number of negative interactions. If this number is old, uh, you have a negative feedback loop, but if this number is even, you have a positive feedback loop. In, so, in simple feedback loops, uh, each element exerts a uh, positive or a negative influence in its own. But uh, in another case, when you, have sim when you don't have simple negative feedback loops, the process is more complex. Uh, uh, the sign of the feedback is determined uh, all dynamics involved in this process. No, no exactly determinates, but it's very important. And in a simple feedback, in a simple negative feedback loops, you have normally uh, homeostasis. In a simple uh, positive feedback loops, you have normally different behavior. Sorry, my, my, my mother's call. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, but if you have, if you have um, complex negative feedback loops, if you have the propagation delay, and you, your system can be dumped or um, periodic. Uh, here, uh, we have some examples in discretalized cases where, uh, with a simple feedback loop that results in stable states, multiple stables, and we, you have a negative feedback loops that are oscillating. And here, uh, it has some conjectures 
that are important. For example, the presence of a positive circuit somewhere in the phase of space is a necessary condition for multistationary multi reach. Um, second, multistationary requires either the presence of a vari variable nucleus or else the presence of two nucleus of opposite sides. And the three, the presence of negative circuits of length as less two, somewhere in the phase space, is a necessary condition for stable periodicity. Okay. Then we have uh, uh, an example uh, with some topics discussed by Professor Marco. Then the diagram. Uh, show uh, the interactions between microphages, interleukine 6, active neutrophils, and apoptotic neutrophils. Uh, this, we have a positive and negative feedback. This situation can be modeled by ODE system, this system, Uh, dynamical system. And the, the fourth equation, the CDT, we have a Hill function, and the, the number, Hill number is equal to, due to uh, the cooperativity between microphages and interleukine 6. This, please, this system has three fixed point, a negative fixed point who, which uh, doesn't have biological sense, a positive fixed point, and zero. Zero is trivial fixed point illustrated in this picture. This situation means that the, the, that, that situation is about wound healing. Uh, then the first picture means the, the wound is healed, the, the skin became health. The, the cells and the interleukine 6 goes to zero. And this, that case, is, this point is stable. What means? The, the eigenvalues have, have real parts, all real parts negative. Lambda equal to A. Uh, this, that system has four eigenvalues, and all this has real part negative. Then, the, this fixed point is stable. In this case, the other fixed point, the positive fixed point, is unstable. Otherwise, the, the trivial fixed point becomes unstable, and the positive fixed point becomes stable. And this, this situation means the, the skin is unhealthed. The, the, the microphage and it interleukine goes to a positive number, and this is a, a, A situation non desejada. Uh, I don't want this situation. It's not desired. Okay. It's not desired. It's not desired. It's not desired. Please. Okay, thanks. Uh, That's it. Questions? Okay, sorry. <laughs> In the beginning, I forgot to mention that we are a diverse group. We are undergrads, we have masters and PhD, and also we have biologists, physicists, and mathematicians. So we want to say thanks to Marco because it was a really, really interesting work, uh, working session. So thanks.
what, what is the control parameter that has been changed between the two situations in your system? What is the control parameter that has been changed? The parameter, the quantity that has been changed between the two situations? Yeah, can I have the mic? The parameters? Yes. The, the most important parameters is this. The, uh, phagocytosi, phi, is the most important. It's okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to, um, one of you explain or clarify the term of homeostasis. Uh, I talk about homeostasis uh, when you talk, when you mention simple uh, negative feedback loops, or, okay? And in this case, each element shows a negative uh, effect in your. An example of homeostasis is our temperature of your body, and it's a, I think, a good, yeah. So homeostasis are important uh, mechanisms of your body. It's, and in some cases, or in very cases, you can associate with oscillations. And this kind of oscillations is associated with simple negative feedback loops. I, a response, I don't know. So hold the other one. No, we don't need it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Uh, okay, hello. Uh, so we are the Active Matter Working Group. Uh, here we have Augustina, uh, Gustavo, Emmanuel, and I am Paulo. Uh, I've been working with, uh, it's my fifth year uh, in this field of Active Matter. Emmanuel is in his second one, Gustavo in his first one, and uh, Three months, yeah. And Augustina probably after the school we will start her first year in active matter, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. No. No. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, oh, and we of course we are from uh, Julia group that is not here because he has ha she have already uh, uh, tr uh, traveled to Oxford, so we thank her a lot for very interesting things and stuff. And so. Uh, we are going to tell you just a, a little bit about Active Matter uh, to share some of the experience that we have in the working group sections. 
So uh, a basic idea about active matter is that, uh, uh, is that it's a field of physics that uh, study how individual uh, active particles like birds, soccer players, cars, or cells interact to each other in order to form macroscopic structures like flocks, soccer teams, traffic, or tissue in order to execute some collective behavior like escape predators, win a match, traffic jam, or wound healing. And, uh, yeah? or avoid traffic jam, exactly. And uh, the, the basic idea is that those collective uh, emergent behaviors uh, are controlled by the laws of transport of information in the systems. In, in other words, is that uh, how the particle, particles interact with each other will determine those collective behaviors. So if uh, the soccer players don't pass the ball very well, they will eventually lose the match. And if the cells cannot sense uh, uh, the information that a wound has occurred, cannot uh, um, propagate across the tissue, they will probably not be able to uh, repair the wound. So in, uh, we have two days of working sessions with Julia. The first one was a very hard one because it was trying to deduce, what, what's the name of what? Multipolar expansion, so uh, it was very troublesome, and yeah, it, what? Yeah, we didn't get it. It was very hard. Yeah, okay. You don't want to explain it? No, okay. You don't want to explain it. And uh, the second day was very much much funnier, where we went through two papers. One of them, Julia has shown here, is about topological defects. And it, uh, this is the focus of her, her research in active matter, where they uh, measure those uh, collective uh, behaviors in here, topological defects, where they uh, map it uh, epithelial cells. So uh, this pointer works, maybe. No. So uh, here, epithelial cells, and here they're on a monolayer. So they map it, uh, this uh, epithelial monolayer, uh, in uh, as a uh, what, what? Nematic, nematic crystal lictal, uh, liquid crystal, and they correlate the topological defects on this uh, crystal on those cells, in this crystal liquid crystal, uh, with cell extrusion, or in other words, cell death. So they could uh, relate uh, those plus one half topological defects here with cell death. And uh, you, can, you can go. And so they show there the place where there's a topological defect. Uh, there's an increase in, uh, in pressure of the cell, uh, eventually leading the cells to die uh, here in the extrusion. This is a very cool process because when the cell is compressed, it makes the nucleus. Uh, Release a, pro yeah, not a yeah. protein, the yap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Yes, associate protein, yeah. Yeah, and this one goes into cytoplasm, and this, this thing makes a signal to cell to kill itself. So it's, it's a very cool thing. Yeah. Uh, and they not only uh, um, uh, show this correlation, but they also made an experimental uh, setup that could induce this, uh, this uh, extrusion, so the, those cell death, by making this star shaped. Uh, this cross here, and and they they showed that uh, uh, comparing to a, 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 a what it says a circle, yeah, uh, we have much more uh, cell death. So uh, I'm I'm getting lost here. Uh, yeah, you you can talk. If you look at the stars, we can see you have more topological defects in the edges of the stars. If you you have the one. Uh, plus half and half, there you have a new picture. And these things compress the cells, so it emits the, the YAG. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. Protein. It's a protein, I, I yeah. think. Yeah. So the cells, the cells kill themselves. And they also make an experiment that they put some light in the cell, an offensive light, and the cells kill itself without this protein. So the pressure is making the cell, the nucleus of the cells send some information for the cytoplasm. Yeah, so their conclusion is that the topological effects are inducing the cell death. So this is uh, the first paper we went through, 
and it's more like an in vitro experiment. And the second one, it's very nice because they take this, those ideas of topological defects and apply it to a, a in vivo model system. That's the Hydra. It's a, a very small animal, like one millimeter uh, of size. Uh, it's a sea animal that uh, has the, the ability to regenerate itself. So it's a, a, a world, worldwide uh, model from morphogenesis. It's, uh, and they show that the, uh, the topological uh, defects uh, on the formation of hydra can uh, be, are related with the morphological structures of the animal, like the foot uh, and the mouth of the animal or the tentacles. So, uh, so um, how much time do, do we have? Someone is counting it? Three minutes. Okay, okay so uh, the idea that uh, you take the hydra and you cut it into the in little pieces until you get uh, only the cells, then you make an aggregate of, of those cells. And um, I'm saying uh, too much. Uh, <laughs> we made an aggregate, they made in this paper, and at some point this aggregate starts to collapse in a spherical yeah. symmetry. Yeah. But if you have something squared like this, the A figure, if when you close it in a, in a sphere, it has to make a topological defect in the, in the edges, in the poles of the ball. So the, the you can see in the next figures, and yeah. this happens in the experiment. Yeah. You can keep going. Yeah, and from this uh, topological defects plus one here, will eventually appear the mouth and uh, the foot of the animal. So uh, this, no, yeah, okay, this uh, and probably one of the most interesting uh, things that we can take as a, a, a takeout message from this working session is about the complexity of biology and the relation of cause and effect. Because in the first uh, paper, they show, uh, Julia paper, they, they show that the topological defects induce this uh, biological uh, process of cell death. And in uh, this paper from those guys from uh, uh, um, Israel Institute of Technology, they uh, can correlate the topological defects with the morphology of the hydra. But they, argue, they strongly argue in the end of the paper telling that uh, the topological defects in this system is not causing the, the, the appearance of the mouth or the tentacles. They are, but they, they can use them to identify these patterns. So this is a very interesting to, to keep in mind. And as our uh, work group activity, right, we, yeah. we, we get together uh, last night on the flat and we work on a simulation using uh, Emmanuel and Gustavo model. And, uh, and now you can. So uh, in the master's work of Emmanuel, he made a model of a synthetic, uh, it's an artificial part, uh, active particle membrane, and in my work, in my PhD, I'm making a model like, it's an extension of his model that I'm putting a nucleus and some conservation volume force. And we see the some simulations from Julius, and we think, oh, maybe we can just try to make something similar and see what's going on. So if our model is good, maybe we can reproduce the data just by a small simulation. Yeah. So here we have the experiment. Uh, OK, you can keep the point. Yeah, so and the experiment and just showing the, here the uh, uh, snapshot of the simulation, or you, you can see that the cells are um, exquisite, similar to the what is expected in the, the idea of the problem. So I, I will put the, the no, movies no, now. No, 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 wait a little. No? Okay. And if you see in these places here, you can see a, the cells on the edge, and you have some cells on the middle, are very similar to this, these places here in the experiment. But oh, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple simulation. We have to make a, a better one to fit the more the parameters, but we also have some sim similar shapes from this, the experiment. So now we can watch how it works. Oh, no. oh. Yeah, I need to do an alt tab here. Okay. Okay, uh, moving. So this is the experiment they have done. Uh, so this is the experiment they have done. In, in the top you have the, the cross, right? Uh, I will show you just one more time because it's very fast. And popping up on the right, the topological defects and stuff. And then the simulation we have done yesterday. And 
mostly was uh, Gustavo in the computer and, and us were around him. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the simulation, so uh, I think it's very cute. Um, using the adjective that Julia uses a lot here, it's it. she had a lot of cute. So, in the simulation, uh, we can play it again. One of the cool things we can see on. The, oh, okay, okay. okay. It's not. Anyway, oh, you see. One of the things we can see in this simulation is that the, is, if you have more frames here, but we don't have no, in this, this time, the cells are in the edges. They are moving upward and, and backward. So they are like shaking, but not moving the entire system because it's, uh, it's a bit crowded in, the, in, this, in, this, kind, in this simulation and have strong forces that make them stuck there. But if we refine the simulation, we can make them um, more similar to the experiment. And also, maybe we can find some some more topological defects. But if we, we see in this the edges of the stars, you see that some topological defects. They are born, you can see here, and after some point, they are destroyed. So I think that is it. If you want to say something, mm -hmm. yeah, there's something you want to add. Uh, you? No. So uh, we thank the organizer in three language. We thank the organizer and the guys here in three languages and. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity and experience and stuff. Thank you. Yeah. If, if you have any questions, you can ask us. Okay. Uh, why research choose eat Hydra? Why? Uh, for experiment. experiment. Um, uh, Probably because Hydra is on, uh, one of the most uh, studied models for uh, morphogenesis and regenerator, re regeneration. So, uh, what? Segregation too. Uh, segregation too. So it's on the, the most used models, and um, they probably have already been working with this, this model and saw that the, uh, they could map uh, an active uh, animatic pattern in the in the morphogenesis of Hydra. So. The reason why they used it, it was probably because they were already using it for other experiments and it's a, a very cool model. Okay. Yeah. Just, just adding something like making some marked. In our university, we have an, uh, a cellular physics laboratory and we work with, with hydras and on one of the experiments we do there is like put some hydras in a, in a shake and, a, and make a milkshake of hydras and the internal cells move into, inside the cells and after we separate them. So it's a very incredible animal. It's a very regenerative pattern, pattern in this animal. Okay, thank you. More questions? Oh, okay. Uh, it's interesting because in the first experiment, the first paper, in the first paper, uh, Julia and her co-workers uh, identified that Topological effects could induce apoptosis, right? Right. So why why do the second author, the second work, uh, why does the second work exclude the possibility of topological effects inducing some some effects, biological effects in the morphogenesis? So, um, by what Julia told us, because she was uh, chatting with them many many times, it's basically about their zoology uh, expertise that the, probably the, the things that it, it starts the, the morphogenesis uh, spots like the mouth and the foot and the tentacles is related to chemical process uh, uh, and chem chemical signaling uh, uh, of the cells. And the topological defects, uh, it only appears after it. So it's um, the cause effect is that the topological defects are coming after this, the, the, this chemical signaling for that start the morphogenesis. While in the first paper, uh, first we have the topological defects, and then you have this compression that starts uh, uh, the chemical signal and into hypo uh, apoptosis. So it's two different ways. Okay. Yeah, okay. okay thank you. Right. Okay. That's okay. So thank you.
uh, hi uh, hello everyone so we are group 2 we were in uh, dr ralph's uh, working group section and uh, in that section he basically um, uh, uh, taught us about a part of his research which uh, allows um, allows us to use diffusion and brownian motion to uh, separate particles so obviously uh, they have to they have to be micron and submicron particles and they uh, these guys will continue ahead okay yeah so these are called thermal ratchets and we thought they were very cool so we wanted to explain them to everyone um, so in general these are particles that can be described by the langevin equation that we studied previously uh, what's weird about them is that kind of just under diffusive motion, we can extract work from the system under particular conditions, and that's what's interesting about them. Um, these, hmm? yeah. <laughs> the, uh, so because if we just say we can get a particle to move in a particular direction um, just by diffusion, that is a little bit counterintuitive and feels like it should break the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, which it would, except for, in order for this to work, we need to be out of equilibrium. Uh, we also need, there are also a couple of other requirements. One is that there is a potential, which we'll explain later, um, that is spatially asymmetric, and we also um, need to make sure that these particles are under kind of thermal motion. So people will talk more about these requirements later, but these are the three important points to remember. Okay, so, uh just so you understand what, uh, how the mechanism really works, we are going to present a minimal model of a ratchet. And this one is extremely simple, so let's see if we can all understand this one and the other ones are going to follow from that. So, uh, is there a laser pointer? Yeah. How does this one work? Oh, yeah. So, suppose I have uh, a potential here, right? So, I have this kind of salt potential. M take note that we are breaking spatial reversal symmetry, right? This is not the same as its mirror image. And uh, under this a potential like this, a particle would just move towards the bottom of the potential well, right? There are many potential wells, but whatever you put in it, it's just going to follow uh, to a potential well. So. Let's drive the system out of equilibrium. What do you do? You make this potential time dependent. And uh, the simplest way to do that is just turn it on and off. So we turn it on and off uh, periodically with some characteristic period. And of course, if the movement is still deterministic, it's going to fall to the bottom of the potential well. Uh, you turn it on and off, it's just staying there. Uh, crucially, when you have Brownian motion, however, this thing is going to tend to fall to the bottom of the potential well. Um, and then you turn off the potential, and this thing is going to diffuse. And we see that it's going to diffuse uh, to the right and to the left. And as long as you match the time scales appropriately, the things that diffuse to the left are going to go to the other, some other region that was previously inaccessible. And hopefully, uh, you can see that it, even if it goes to the right, it's probably still going to stay in its own region here. So as long as you match the time scales, the appropriate time scales here are the time scale defined by this length, the diffusive time scale defined by this length, and the time scale with which you turn on and off the potential, you are going to be able to make this particle have a net movement on average to the left. Is that clear to everybody? Do you? Okay, so uh, that's basically it, right? That's the thermal ratchet and everything we're going to see follows a similar pattern. So here we have a little simulation I wrote yesterday. It's a really basic simulation, but good enough for pedagogical purposes. <laughs> so here we have uh, some particles 100 particles in a two-day space, space. These particles will diffuse in this space, will diffuse freely in the y-axis, but in the, uh, the x-axis we have a potential, an asymmetric potential there. So initially the particles are like, confined in this potential well. Yeah. And 
we will uh, switch off the uh, the potential and let's what happened. The particles start to diffuse, but when we uh, switch on again the potential, we have uh, oriented diffusion to my left side. So in the end, as we see, we have more particles to the left side, so we are oriented at diffusion to a specific direction, right? So really simple. We use the Langevin discretized version. It's the Euler algorithm, and it's a really uh, small Python script. So we, we have seen uh, an experiment about this kind of behavior that was Ralph's work. Um, so we have uh, this kind of micro, we have uh, like a microfluidic chamber with these microstructures which are, uh, have like large and small spots. Can I have So here we have large spots, here are small spots that act as traps for the particles. So what, what's going to happen is that if the particles are, so what we're doing is driving the particles with a periodic potential uh, with a square pulse. Actually we have uh, like polystyrene, polystyrene beads in water, so they are negatively charged and we apply a voltage along the x-axis that is going to run them to the right and left. When, the, um, when we only apply these square poles uh, symmetrically, there will be no net movement because the probability to go to left and right will be exactly the same. But uh, the, the crucial point is that we also apply a static contribution, this UDC to the square poles, so that it gets biased in one direction rather than another. In this way, we're going to create a net movement on the particles along a preferred direction. Uh, how do I start the... Okay. So uh, the, the thing is that the electric field is driving the particles in a defined direction, but uh, the, um, the diffusion allows, allows the particles to move from one spot to the other. The point is that if the, if the driving is, is really strong, the particles will be, will be moving really fast along the x-axis. So when they pass a large gap, they will then be led into one of these smaller gaps and be trapped. Instead, if the driving is low, they will pass a large gap, then have time to diffuse along the y-axis and probably move to one of the other large gaps. So uh, for, large, for small values of this static driving that we use to bias the square pools, we can get uh, particles to, to diffuse, uh, to diffuse way, way more than they would with a, a large driving. So, okay, this is, uh, these are measurements, this, the curve is the theoretical results from a simulation, and these are experimental results that show the uh, net velocity, net average velocity, velocity of the particles against the value of the of the steady contribution to the to the voltage, and we see a really peculiar behavior. That means when the force is positive, the particles have net negative velocity. That means that they're moving on average in the direction opposite to the force that we're applying. This seems like um, kind of absurd because we, we know Newton's second law, if I push something to the right, it's supposed to go to the right. But this uh, statistical, on average, this thermal noise is acting so, so that actually the opposite, the opposite happens. So when we have these small values 
of the static driving the particles will actually move on average on the opposite on the opposite direction. I guess that's yeah, I kind of explained that. We have this kind of pattern. So the point is that we have to take a, a period for the driving that is uh, long enough to let the particles diffuse and move to from the large spot along the y-axis to another large spot. So I guess that is this kind of... of so uh, this kind of behavior can be exploited to to like uh, create separation in different kinds of particles basing on the fact that the diffusion coefficient for different particles depends on on their sides so uh, we can um, we can imagine that if we use a system composed of large particles and small particles the small particles will will diffuse way faster than the small particles, uh, than the large particles. So we can actually create a separation between different kinds of particles and isolate, for example, colloids, cells, and biomolecules in, in systems in which they're usually like intertwined or mixed. So I guess that's all. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is Ali, Benjamin, uh, Ricardo, and Gustavo, and I'm Rakshit. And we thank especially Dr. Ralph and all of the others, and the IFT, A A APS, everyone. Thanks. Uh, yeah, any questions? No, just a simple question. What? Uh, how did you model the potential for the simulations? Did you use, like... Some of signs. What did you? Yeah, with tool. We use a, a sign tool, sign functions. How the name of the this kind of potential? Then? It's like uh, so tooth. what? So tooth. So, so tooth. Okay. It's like no. a, it's like the first two terms in a Fourier expansion of of the square well. Oh, uh, I I think it was sine x plus sine two x, right? Yeah. 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 Sine x plus sine two x. It's just that. Anyone else? We can show the, I think, here. Oh, there is the, here, I define the function. What is the button for the, this one? Here, uh, hi, I have the potential function. It's a sine, and this is a. Yeah. Sine this x plus sine 2x. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we'll just talk a little bit about the Fernando and Eduardo's group, which was, had more dynamics of uh, Q&A about simulations and electrostatic 
um, interactions, how to screen them. So, um, my name is Luis Fernando. I am Leandro's student, so I am an experimentalist. And when we are in contact with molecular simulations, it's much more, um, so to speak, in the articles, more result-oriented. So what we see are basically plots of RMSD, etc. So we don't see in depth what happens. So the idea we have is basically you just throw a PDB in a solvent and watch what happens, put some IOs, etc. Uh, but we, as a physicist, we have an idea about what the, I mean, we have the forces to describe the force fields, but you know, we have the idea, okay, so basically if we put the right, uh, the right interactions, the parameters from different uh, variations of the force field, well, they may have some differences, but we may describe, you know, in a general way, kind of hand waving in a correct way, right? And also, there are subtleties, but I mean, come on, it, it, it's really important for us to be formal, but you know, why, why aren't more people doing this? Is the Linux terminal that is intimidating? We need graphical user interface to make this more popular. What's happening? So, when you go a little more in depth, like in the classes, in the discussions, or in articles, we see that, well, what we may have, it's like, it's like small angle X-ray scattering, which is my technique of work. You have an input, you, if you don't have problems of compilation or whatever with the programs, you will have an output. But it may just, if when you have something weird, you may have a new phenomenon. But most likely, you have just, you know, wrong results. And you need the understanding of the molecular dynamics uh, process and everything to understand what's going on, understanding your program, your force fields, etc. So, if you're about to work with molecular dynamics, you have to be very careful because it's not that simple. It looks simple in the articles, it's very beautiful, but, you know, just... Take a breath and slowly and study your system. How to understand your system. So the first thing that we discussed a little bit in our group section is uh, was about the importance of selecting very well your force field. So basically, because it is it contains all the potentials that it, you will use and also the parameters, so it will model all the interaction between your atoms or objects that you are simulating. So this is a real important step for you to simulate uh, things very well. So uh, the, I think that the most important thing for uh, choosing your force field is to see if it has like uh, validations by literature results or experimental results. So. If you look for force fields, you found, find a lot of different kinds of them, and maybe it can be developed by different types of, of proteins or biological systems or materials. So you have to keep in mind that you will choose your force field based exactly on what you are wanting to, to simulate. And if you don't find any force field that is specific for your use, you have to develop them. So you can use like quantum calculations for trying to find those parameters and then you have to c compare that with experimental results in order to give some validation for your new force field. So another thing that we really thought it was important to talk about is that when you make the simulation, it's very important to distinguish the equilibration part from the part that you really can sample data. Because when you have the equilibration part, you cannot like, you becoming, you were getting data that will not be physical, like valid. So it's very important to see if you already have passed the equilibration type uh, time and also like give time for the simulation to get in this part. And another thing that's very important, it's that sometimes the energy is already equilibrated, but the property that you want to analyze is not equilibrated yet. So you still need more time to the simulation to equilibrate this other property that you want to sample. So uh, to consider when you are doing MD simulation, uh, you have to how say my the, the uh, before uh, you if your 
RMC curve is converged, possible other properties not converge in your simulation. Uh, it, it two is, is the suitability of the model of the, with the size scale of your system and the pH constant simulation are important to the protein extracting interaction because uh, if you are simulating with a constant charge a simulation uh, and you are interested in the electrostatic interaction in your protein, uh, could be uh, important the, the, the effect of pH. And the other important uh, to consider when uh, this uh, Fernando chose in the lecture uh, yesterday of uh, the comparison of molecular simulation and Boson Bosman and the the main uh, conclusion is uh, depending of the question and the computing the computing resource how detailed is the model and the method we use if uh, depending of the question if you use Poisson Boltzmann or molecular simulation or you are using uh, all, all all atom simulation or a coarse grain simulation, if uh, depending what are you uh, looking uh, to n know about your system and what is the question and how is the detail in the model and the, the method where, what are you are using. Uh, okay, and uh, we also came with this slide because uh, 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 some of us are experimentalists, and uh, uh, we came here to have, uh, for example, any theoretical descriptions of what we observe in our lab. And, for example, in my case, there are isolated polyelectrolyte interactions. Uh, all, all of us know that salt and pH are uh, quite important properties that manage the the phase behavior of these complexes. And the interesting point, for example, we came for, uh, for example, the Tenfor Kirk model that we can use for calculate difference on PKA. And, Uh, I don't work with proteins, but uh, I work with uh, weak polyelectrolytes, and it's quite important for for us to understand uh, what's, for example, uh, how the PKA behaves with pH and and salt concentrations. So uh, that's why uh, the school uh, has provided uh, these theoretical information that we can apply in in a, in our experiments. Um, is there something something to add? No? Okay, thank you. Hello? Hello? Uh, Putin type to me? Yeah, it's yes. Yeah. No, you can let go. Yeah. Uh, well, guys, I'm sorry for the messy presentation, but we talk about, firstly talk about the very basics of the simulations and what was the insights that the very basic students in simulations had had, had along the, the workshop. And then we planned to give more specific details about the, prog not the programs, but the models itself. And since it's, it was getting bigger and bigger, we decided up to split the presentation so well. Firstly, we need to have in mind that I, we think that we need to be in mind very, very uh, know that what we are doing are models. It can be fancy ones, but still are models. So if you have your data here that are the, the black dots, you can have a model that pretty is not that good, or you can have a better one. But if you try to push harder and harder and harder your model, maybe you can do overfitting that so it's it's not science, it's not science, that's what we are trying to do. So from any point of view, there are several different models of AGNU 
the contemporaneous one and more detailed one. It's like the spherical cow, but to GNU version. And also, we have no GNU, no cows in science, in molecular science. So what we have are more nivel, uh, a level of detailment, where we can have atomistic stuff or uh, more field-based and not atomistic. And I'm sorry for the Portuguese slides, but this is what we are trying to point out here. So even if you are talking about your time and size scale, you need to be concerned about what you're doing. Because if you're trying to do a molecular dynamic simulation to evaluate something that's big, huge scale, you are not having computational cost and not having available uh, computational power to get the simulation done. So you need to be very careful about the size and the time you want to simulate and the model you are trying to do this. Uh, uh, the reason because the sorry the reason because you have no computational power is because, is because how much you add of physical detailment in your in your model it's get tougher to be done because you need to do more calculations and more calculation needs more time and so we have some uh, some models these are oh, some models I got just as an example, but to evaluate energy binding here, and we have pretty cheaper models. You can do it very fast to a lot of molecules, but the accuracy is not that good. Or we have very good models that you cannot do to bigger molecules. You cannot simulate too much time, but they are very accurate. Great. So for the model point of view, this is a protein. But also, if you have the right hypothesis, this is also a protein. And this is also a protein. It all depends on your hypothesis if your system is responding satisfactorily to your, to your, to your hypothesis. Uh, we have very good talks here, and Fernando and uh, Eduardo showed us a lot of models. You can re-watch the, the talks, the lectures, follow the, the page on the YouTube. But what I want to do to talk here is really point out the, uh, the, the limitations of each one of your models have. Like, back in time, you used to consider that a protein is just a spherical entity with a charge. But we discovered that it cannot be so good in some applications. So we needed to explicitly point the relative positions between the sides, so a new model was created, the Kirchhoff one. Then, okay, your, particle, uh, your protein cannot be that spherical. So we developed the Poisson-Boltzmann in a model that the surface of the protein is modeled differently. But it still have problems. We have no IOA, ion interaction correlation. So if we needed to do this, if your system really need to carry out explicitly this IO ion correlation, we need to do Monte Carlo or molecular dynamic simulations. But all those examples are in implicit solvent. So if the solvent uh, behavior is important in your system, you need to explicitly simulate them. And you can simulate this, your system with point charges fixed along the whole simulation. But if somehow, in any moment of your simulation, your protein needs to change, change charges, uh, molecular dynamics and classical stuff is not ready to do the, with, the, with this properly yet. We are getting better and better. But you need to do a better simulation. You know, one option is the constant pH simulation or what kinds of approach. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of, of models. And the main point we decided to bring here is that before you do any simulation, before you get in any uh, span of computational time, think about your model, think about your system, and check if really your model is modeling what you want to see. Any model is a good model, depending on the answers you want to bring of them. Thank you very much for the attention. And we are now open to questions. Well then, thank you again.
oh sure we are we are a very big group so i'm not telling each one's name but i would like to thanks the organization for the lectures for the beautiful lectures and for all the concern you needed to have in order to organize the organization the event very thank you Can we start? Yeah. So, okay, we are the Experimental Techniques Group led by Leandro Barbosa. I hope you guys, computational scientists, don't get very bored by it. Uh, um, so this is us, and in this presentation we decided to, um, actually we discussed yesterday, and we decided that we would um, present how the techniques that we learned here can be applied to our own researches. So basically, we, de we divided um, our own research fields in proteins and peptides, polymers, membranes, lipids, and nanoparticles. And we are basically just go not going into um, theory. We're just going to give us some applications that we already knew and others that we learned during this week. Um, before we start, it's actually good to say, um, when you want to do experimental experiments, you need to consider the length scale and the resolutions of your methods, which um, here we got a slide from Leandro's lecture. And here we can see some techniques and their resolutions. This is very important for what you want to study and um, what you're trying to figure it out, as other groups have mentioned before. And um, it's also good to mention that no technique is perfect. All the techniques, they have their own limitations, their own flaws, also their own qualities. So if you're experiment experimentalist physicist, you probably will use uh, three to four. So if you're experimentalist, you will probably use three to four or even more techniques. They complement each other and you can actually get better information and stuff like that. So we're going to begin with SACS, which stands for Small Angle X-ray Scattering. As we learned this week, it's a technique that is it's an average technique, so it basically um, analyzes your sample as a whole thing. It will average the parameters you get, and there are multiple parameters as if um, volume, volume per unit, um, structure, form, and stuff like that. And we have, we have um, discussed, and we, for nanoparticles, we discovered that we can actually use this technique to learn more about the internal structure of your system, so you can get better characterization of it. For proteins and peptides, we can use this technique very broadly. I mean, we can use it for morphology, so we can actually um, characterize the structure. We can talk about kinetics, um, about how the photon and unfolding processes undergo, and stuff like that. For membranes and lipids, there is a representation over there. Um, we can study structures because liposomes, vesicles, and membranes, they can assume various um, structure forms. So if you use SACS, you can actually tell if you have a single bilayer, if you have multiple bilayers, you can tell the thickness of your bilayers, and all those things are very relevant So when you're analyzing stuff. And we can actually localize molecules in your membrane or in your lipid bilayer, whatever, um, which is also very important as if you're studying uh, drug membrane interactions. And for molecular dynamic simulations, you can actually um, simulate the SACS curves, or you can use the data provided by this technique to write better input so you have um, more accurate, uh, more accurate uh, simulations and compare your simulations with the experimental data. 
Okay, so another technique that we studied this week is the cryo electron microscopy. It's a technique that has become very popular in the last few years because it earned a Nobel Prize, so it's very important. And different from sex, uh, when you are studying your sample with a cryo AM, you are looking directly to a particle. So it's not an average of the whole sample, but you are looking at your particle. Of course, you can do an average of several particles afterwards, but uh, the main point to you is a single particle analysis. And it's a very high resolution technique, so you can use to identify, for example, secondary structure of proteins, because the length scale that we showed before goes in between, goes until two angstroms, so it's very high resolution. And another stuff that we found in this interesting in this technique is the way that the, you you freeze the water. So it's such a fast process that you don't give time to the water to, um, to the water to change to ice and form a crystal structure. So you have like an instant picture of what happened. And, okay. and another important thing uh, about this technique is that uh, you can study in the native, yeah, in the native state of your uh, sample. So, in opposite to other techniques, you don't have to modify the sample a lot to study. Okay, so another technique that uh, we comment a lot during the lectures and the working group sections is the NMR. So, it's a good technique to characterize your molecules and particles, and in, it has a high resolution for small proteins, so it's very interesting, and in pro proteins with less than 50 kilodaltons. And uh, you can also study the protein in solutions, so it's a very positive thing about this technique. So, about DLS and Zeta Potential. DLS, or dynamic light scattering, and Zeta Potential are two techniques in which global information about these samples can be obtained. Um, in Professor Ralph's lectures, we learn a lot about diffusion constant of Brownian's motion, which is an uh, important part for this for theory of DLS. To be guaranteed that the that the uh, optimal uh, concentration, we need to have a uh, very diluted systems uh, to uh, to prevent the multiple scattering and the force between the particles. And about that potential, in other hand, uh, we have a measurement about the, the ch about change in electrical of the, the of the our sample, and uh, for example, we can measure in liposomes or um, membranes the superficial change of the uh, the electrical uh, so, uh, electrical change of the superficial for our extrusions. And what this implies, in it can indicate uh, a lot of a lot of things, such as uh, interactions be between the other molecules and binding binding with them, uh, formation or deletion of domains, and change in the electric uh, charge with polar head of our lipids, uh, due to a uh, with the the environment, such as pH. So now to mention uh, the poster section, which is an important part. So in science, the the conversation with another uh, areas and another to know new techniques or his exper uh, experiments. We we. 
we thought in, in mention this part because uh, some of these techniques are so be able to apply it in our areas, uh, such as Raman spectroscopy, circular decroism de techniques, SLS, EPR, and FTR. So, to conclude, we want to take, thank you all for your attention, for your presence, thank the professors and the organizers, and the foundation to be, to make able this, this event. And so, thank you all for your attention. Uh, any questions? Comments? Lunch time? <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here, for enjoying the lectures. Um, a lecture wouldn't be anything without the audience, so you're the most important part here. And uh, you did a great job, and I'm very impressed by the talks here. I think that was great. You found connections between the different uh, lectures. You did your own simulations presented new stuff even that has not been covered in the lectures. So really well done. So I, I have to applaud to, to the students. Yeah, thank you very much for being here. Hope you had a great time. And who knows, maybe we meet again here for another school or at another place in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'm not going to repeat everything, but uh, I, I do echo what, what Rafa just said to you. It was great to have you to, to spend all the time together. So our, let's say, efforts to prepare this coup, to organize the whole thing, to run the show, was in some way uh, very good because we could see that we could take advantage of this. So thank you. Uh, I'm sorry if things didn't work in proper way. We were joking that we are not pizza to make everybody happy. But I hope you can still have a good time uh, and a safe way back home. So thank you and see you in the future. Thank you.